presentation is kind of an interesting one because we're going to be asking the question about death. And uh, we're going to sort of observe um, what scripture has to say about the, the topic of death. Of course, death is a, a virtually universal reality with just a couple biblical exceptions. Jesus, of course, was resurrected from the dead. And the Bible speaks of a man named Elijah who went to uh, heaven in a fiery chariot. It also speaks of a man named Enoch, who the Bible says was, was taken by God. Um, but with, except for these rare exceptions, these, these, these uh, individuals who, who sort of have gone on the other side, for the vast, vast majority of the human family, death is it's a reality. And it's a reality that uh, um, we're all sort of not looking forward to, but we know it's, it's going to happen. It's just part of life. As the old saying goes, there's two things certain, death and taxes. And, uh, but here's the interesting thing. From a biblical perspective, if the Bible is true, and uh, we've been trying to build a case here over the series of our seminar, um, that it is true and that it's believable, and not just believable, but, but beautiful, that it's awesome, that the picture is profound and, and compelling. Um, if, if the Bible is true on this particular point, it's an absolutely awesome thing because death is not something to be afraid of. In fact, the Bible refers to death in the most innocuous way. It refers to death simply as a sleep. And, uh, and I wonder if there's anybody else here who, like myself, likes to sleep. Does anybody else look forward to sleeping? Man, I, I, I love sleeping. And uh, in fact, part of the reason that I love sleeping, and I tease my wife with this a little bit sometimes, and that is that uh, I get to dream. Are any of you dreamers? Oh, man, I dream like crazy. Every night, it's like full cinematic movies. Like, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Every single night, I dream. And I've been dreaming for so long now, since I was, you know, just young. I can remember dreams I used to have. And uh, that I've gotten to the place where I can kind of control my dreams. Like, I am the master of my own destiny. So in, in my dreams, I get to be the hero. I, if a situation is kind of going, you know, a little bit the way I don't want it, I just... I just ride into it and just fix it. It's like, hey, this is my dream. I can do what I want. And um, so, so I'm one of those people that really looks forward to sleep. So with this sort of, this sort of perspective, uh, biblically speaking, death is not something to be afraid of. It's a reality, and uh, it is something that happens to us. But if, in fact, Jesus uh, lived and died, okay, those are the two easy ones, but and rose again, if that's true, then for the believer, those that have put their confidence in Jesus' faithfulness, there is nothing to fear in death. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is found in the New Testament. I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I just love that idea that God has not given us the spirit of fear. There is nothing for us to be afraid of. And certainly God is not someone to be afraid of. He is, as my friend Dwight Nelson likes to say, someone to be a friend of. All right, now what I want to do before we get right into the question of death, I want to set it up. And we're going to set it up by sort of continuing with what we were talking about in our last presentation. And that is to use the sort of airplane analogy that, that the church was launched by Christ, and it got off to a good start, but it began to falter fairly shortly after its initial takeoff. It might have gotten to sort of 10,000 feet in, in, in our analogy, and then it begins to have troubles, and then it goes down 9,000, 8,000, 7,000, until eventually it has basically a crash-like experience, and it has to be sort of raised from uh, the ashes when a new church, the reformers say, hey, we want something different. The, the short version of church history is that the church was formed by Christ, deformed through the medieval period, reformed during the period of the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries and beyond. And that reformation is working toward a restoration of biblical truth. And uh, in, in keeping with this, sort of, this motif here, what we want to do is see that, that the nature of man and consequently also his death and, and the death of uh, females as well, men and women, um, that, that, that this is a topic that has been grossly misunderstood because of some of the deformation that took place in the church during uh, this medieval period. Now, we've sort of asked the question here, what was it that changed? We talked about the Sabbath that has been replaced by Sunday, and there are very interesting reasons for that. And uh, the reasons revolve around um, Constantine. We talked about him in our last presentation. But 
Constantine really was the one. Now, there was Sunday observance even before the time of Constantine, but Constantine is the one who gave it a real uh, kick, a real, a real launch, because he was wanting to bring unity to his um, empire, the Roman Empire, and in so doing, he basically allowed the pagan festivals of the worship of the venerable day of the sun and the Christian festivals to become essentially amalgamated. And it's especially after the time of Constantine, 4th century, 5th century, and beyond, that Sunday becomes a prominent fixture in early Christendom. Now, I want to reiterate again. It was already sort of creeping in in 2nd century into the 3rd. But by the time we get to the 4th, it's, think of it like the hands are in the cement. You know, when cement has been poured and it's not totally soft, but it's beginning to harden... Even in the, the second century and the third century, this idea of Sunday sacredness was already coming in. And the Sabbath, and that's not the most significant thing, by the way. The sacredness of Sunday is a consequence of something that's far worse, and that is that the Sabbath was lost sight of. Right? If you want to go to church on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, no problem with any of that. So it wasn't the elevation of Sunday that was the primary problem. It was the elevation of Sunday at the expense of the biblical Sabbath. And those are two sides of the same coin. And so as the handprint is placed into the increasingly firming concrete, what happens by the time we get to the 4th century with Constantine and beyond, that concrete is hardened. Right? The, the Sabbath is almost universally lost sight of, except in a few instances here and there. And what you're dealing with is a church that here has adopted Roman pagan tradition in the place of the biblical Sabbath. Well, that's just one for instance. You'll remember back in Daniel chapter 7 in our prophecy that we looked at in our last presentation that one of the things that that little horn power would think to do was to change the very times and laws of God. Well, that's exactly what's happened. The very times, God's sacred time, God's holy time, the time that we described where, where God was creating and he was speaking things into existence. But when it came time for the Sabbath, he came and he formed and he fashioned and he created and he made man. That time, which is a direct frontal attack on the character of God and the kind of person that he is, that, that Sabbath was lost sight of. Right? It, was, it was lost sight of at the expense of a day that just happened to be a pagan day. And Constantine was seeking to bring unity to his empire and to unite this sort of increasingly amalgamated version of Roman paganism and Christianity, which eventually becomes the identifying mark of the medieval church. Now, with that sort of in, in mind, we also have other incorrect and superstitious and, and Greco-Roman ideas that came into the church. A whole new way of viewing God. God was viewed by Plato, Sarah, Socrates, Aristotle, and other Greek philosophers as being impassable, timeless, and perfect. And maybe I'll just spend a moment here on this impassable idea. When, when you see that word impassable, it doesn't mean that you can't get around him. It's not like you're in traffic and the car in front of you is impassable. That's not what's being spoken of here. The, the same root word here for impassable is the word passion. Passion. And the idea, the Greek ideal of God, particularly for the Stoics and others, was that God was so perfect that there could be no variation in himself. Right? Perfection was de defined in Greek thinking, not biblical thinking, in Greek thinking as a static reality, an unchangeable reality that was so perfect in itself that it, it wasn't prone to any sort of variation. Right? Now, there are some elements of, of truth in that, but the Greeks took it, uh, of course, to, to a level that, that Scripture never intended and, and to a way that Hebrews didn't ever think about God. And so in this particular way, they said that he's impassable. He is not liable to emotion. He's not the kind of God that has, you know, emotional changes from, you know, this, uh, from this emotional state to this emotional state. They viewed that as weakness, right? They also viewed God's um, relationship to time as being... Uh, one in which he was perfectly indifferent to time. In fact, existed totally outside of time. Where the biblical God is, is revealed as coming into time and participating with us in time. And, and the whole biblical narrative is built around uh, time. Whether it's the time prophecies or the calendar system of the Jews. That, that God is in time and he, he's participating with us in it. So too God's emotions. The Bible says things like um, uh, that, 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 that God's... Um, uh, uh, the, what's the verse I'm looking for here? I want to get this one exactly right. The joy of the Lord is our strength, right? Jesus, who was God incarnate, the Bible says, wept. 
right? You, you get a, a sense for the, the passion of God in the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah when God is calling to His people. He's lamenting over His people. So this sort of Greek ideal of what, what a perfect God-like being would be is true in some of its elements, but actually we must always allow Scripture to be our final word on who and what God is because this is the book that God Himself inspired to show us who He is. So far, so good. So rather than being this sort of stoic, static, you know, detached, timeless, totally separate being from us. Quite the opposite is revealed in Scripture. God longs to be with us, to come close to us, to interact with us in both space and time, in our emotional sphere, in our social sphere, in our spiritual spheres as well. So far, so good? Now, I wish I could tell you that this basic Greek idea of God was something that just sort of came into the church and then went away. That is not the case. In fact, there are many significant Greek residues... Greek thinking residues within the Christian church today that have colored the way that people think about God. And uh, time doesn't allow me to get into that in too much detail, but I want to spend quite a bit of time here on this last one, the nature of man. And we're going to talk today about uh, this phrase, anthropological dualism. Now, for some of you, that might be like, whoa, you just lost me there. That was a whole lot of syllables. It's been a long day. Um, but I want you to hang, hang in there with me for just a bit. Basically put, anthropological dualism is just kind of what it sounds like if you just break it down. First of all, what is the study of anthropology? What is an anthropologist study? The study of mankind, the study of people. Okay, so anthropology comes from anthropos in the Greek, mankind, right, humankind. And dualism, that's an easy one, dual is how many? Dual is two. So anthropological dualism, as we're going to see in just a little bit, is basically the idea that, that mankind is made up of two parts. Two parts. Now, that's kind of right, but it's mostly wrong. And in just a bit, we'll talk about how it's kind of right, and we'll talk more about how it's mostly wrong. But the, the nature of, of uh, man is something that has got to be understood if we're going to come to grips with this idea of what happens after death. Now... Going back one here, what we've, what we've mentioned is that after Constantine, and this is actually a very famous painting. I think we had it up in our last session, but I didn't talk, any about it, talk anything about it. This is a very famous painting from inside the Vatican, and it's, it's somewhat difficult to see, but sort of to the left center, you can see a man down on his knees, and he's standing before a man that looks uh, to be blessing him and is a bit of kind of like a priestly figure or a, a, a pope figure. Well, this painting is called, if I'm not mistaken, The Donation of Constantine. And what is being depicted here is basically uh, after Constantine moved the seat of his empire from uh, Rome in the, western, uh, in the western part of the Roman Empire to Constantinople, which was uh, several hundred miles east, he left someone in charge, and the person that was uh, supposedly left in charge was, and to a degree was left in charge, was the Bishop of Rome. Now, it's kind of interesting because this, this painting, The Donation of Constantine, that, that title, The Donation of Constantine, is actually the title of a document that is now a known forgery that was actually invented by the church, a document that we now know the church completely made up, completely, you can just do a little research on it on the internet because you know everything on the internet is true. I don't know if you knew that or not, but it's all true if it's on the internet. And if it's on television, it's all true. Everything. Of course not. But you can just go... For example, to like Wikipedia, that'd be a good place to start. Just type in the donation of Constantine. It was basically a document that supposedly was an official document that Constantine had at some point given to the Bishop of Rome saying, you know, you're in charge now. Well, of course, there was no actual legal document, but the concept certainly is what took place, and that's what's being described here in this painting. The problem was, as we talked about in our last lesson, what's the deal with church, is that when that power vacuum was left and the Bishop of Rome was increasingly elevated in uh, the estimation of, of Christianity and of especially all these new adherents to the Christian faith. Because most of these people remember as this group of people come rushing in from former paganism into the Christian church. They're looking to someone, okay, who, what do we do? What do we believe? Who are we? And so now the Bishop of Rome becomes increasingly elevated as the, as the one who tells you what it means to be a Christian. And that's what's sort of uh, being uh, depicted here. Now, Paul had anticipated this very thing 
And uh, he actually says here, this is in the book of Acts, Luke records Paul's words to a group of people in Ephesus. And he says an interesting thing here. Speaking to a group of religious leaders, he's on his way to Rome and he knows he's going to die there. He says this, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So he's writing to the, he's speaking to the religious leaders here. He says, you are the overseers. Watch what he goes on to say. For I know this. Not I think this might happen, or I, I imagine that this could end up being the case, perhaps. No, he says, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from, among your own, also from among yourselves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. What, what Paul is foretelling here is remarkable, and it's the thing that we talked about in our last presentation, that the greatest enemy of the church would not come from outside persecuting, but that the enemy of the church, the greatest enemy, would actually come from inside betraying the basic doctrines and truth of Christianity. And Paul says that here. He says, look, 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 look. We, we know that savage wolves are going to come in. And you can just imagine some of them would have said, yes, we're on the lookout. We know that Rome will come in with its great persecuting power. But then what he says would have been really shocking. He says, yeah, from among your own selves. He's speaking to religious people, to religious leaders. From among your own selves, men will rise up, not with persecuting power, but speaking perverse things, untrue things, and in so doing will draw away disciples of Christ after themselves. Paul here anticipates the very thing that Daniel had said would happen. Now, not only does Paul mention this, and we already saw in 2 Thessalonians in our last presentation, Jesus talks about it as too. In fact, you can go read in John chapter 16, verses, I think it's 1 to 4, where Jesus says, hey, look, I'm sending you out as wolves, or excuse me, I'm sending you out as, as sheep, and there are going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm sending you like, out like lambs among wolves. And he went so far as to say in John 16 that there's going to come a time when people will kill you and think they're doing God a service. Now, just let that sink in. What, what he's saying is, is religious people will kill you in my name. Right? You will be, and this is exactly what happened through the medieval period where because of persecution, the true church of God was actually persecuted by the visible church of God and Jesus' prophecy as well as Daniel's and Paul's were coming exactly true that the church was being persecuted by none other than the church right the church and, and the Bible then has to make a distinction and in the book of Revelation it makes the distinction by calling that church the church in the wilderness this was the church that sort of had its name on the marquee right? This was the visible church, the marquee church, the church that everybody thought was the church, but the church in the wilderness, oh, they were the ones that were being stamped here. And that's very interestingly what Jesus himself says. A time is coming when people from within the church will have such a perverse understanding of me and my father that they will actually think they're doing a good service by killing you and even by torturing you. And I tell you, if, if your version of God and I'll just say a word on this. If your version of God or your church or your faith tradition, and I'm just going to pull out both barrels here and just boom, say it like it is. If your version of God can in any way advocate or allow for the torture of another human being as somehow fitting into God's plan, you need a new picture of God. That, you got, that's got to go. But here's an interesting thing, and this will come up tomorrow. You can see, and man, this whole thing fits together like a... a a puzzle. If you believe that God is the kind of God that will actually cause or in some cases allow, whatever language you want to use, people to be tortured throughout unending eternal ages in the fire of hell. If that's the kind of God you serve, well then really why should you have any misgivings about torturing somebody for a short period here on earth, especially if it benefits them spiritually? Do you see how that works? This gets back to our basic point about the table of truth. If we get our picture of God wrong, we get everything else wrong. That's why we start there. Is the Sabbath, for example, important? Absolutely it's important. Is, is creation important? It's absolutely important. Is the Bible important? Absolutely important. Is, is all, are all of these various teachings that we've been talking about important? The answer is yes. We could line up all of these different teachings. But here's the thing. If we start with anything other than 
the central truth about God's character and nature, we are liable to have a, an imbalanced or skewed version of religion. Now, let me just give an example of that. How many of us have met people who, and maybe you are that person, so let me try and offer a gracious corrective if you are, but how many of us have met people who the main thing that they just, that when you, when you encounter them in their Christian experience, they just want to set you right. They just want to set you straight. Right? Whether it's about the Sabbath or the state of the dead or the soon second coming or what you should and shouldn't eat or should and shouldn't drink. And they're going to they're gonna set you right. Or, or maybe they just want to set the world right. And what happens is, is that their religion basically becomes, rather than a relationship with a beautiful being, namely God, their religion is just a bunch of information in the head. And they want you to believe the right information. And if you believe the right information, then you're in a right standing with God. As if God is saving smart people. Right? As if that's the point. God's like, man, we, I can't save any dumb people. I can only save smart people. I need people to transmit lots of information. Get out there and give them the data. And so we just go to the water cooler in our office or we go to the university and we're like, well, you know, Saturday's really the Sabbath. And you know, when you die, you sleep the sleep of death and await the resurrection. And you know, you shouldn't be eating those unclean foods and you shouldn't be... And they're like, whoa, I believe everything you've said. Great, you're in now. Right? You have the right information in your brain and God is saving people with the right information in their brain. Now, is there anything wrong with correct information? No, 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 no. But all of these things, the Sabbath and all of these correct doctrines are simply windows or prisms through which, not prisons, prisms through which we view the beautiful character of God. Right? The point is not so you can believe all the right things. The point is that when you believe the right things, your picture of God is the true one. Do you get that? And I tell you, there's just too many people in religion for whom it's a checklist. I believe that, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that. And then they'll go, okay, so do you believe, okay. Mm -hmm. All we got to do is work on this one, and then you can join my church. You just believe that one, and now you, well, okay, there's nothing wrong with having right information and wanting people to believe the right things. But beloved, it's not just about data. It's not just about information. It's about transformation. What God is trying to get us to do is to fall in love with Him and His person. And when we start with that, when we start with a correct biblical view of who God is, well, now all of the doctrines go out. They, they fan out from that like spokes. And each one, a, a prison, prism, each one, a, a, a window, each one, a glass through which we can see, oh, man, God looks really awesome through that perspective. Whoa, he looks really awesome there too. And like a diamond, different shades, different facets, different perspectives, but always beautiful. Yeah? So back to, the, back to the hell thing. The hell thing is a particularly tricky one because, and we'll talk about this tomorrow. It's our first presentation tomorrow. If you actually think that God, a God of love, if you think it's somehow consistent that a God of love could allow people to suffer eternal conscious torment in the fires of hell, then you would have very, you would have no misgivings. You'd have no problem with torturing someone for just a few hours or a few days or a few weeks here if you thought you were, in their totally perverse religiosity, doing them a good service, getting them to repent, getting them to confess. And, oh, wasn't that great? Wasn't that great? We tortured him right into faith. Right? In other words, if, you're, if your picture of God will allow for that, you need a new picture of God. And yet that's much of the history of the medieval church. I was just recently in Romania. My wife is from Romania. And we went and toured a castle called Castle Braun. And it's a very interesting castle because it's, it's uh, sort of billed or marketed as Dracula's castle. And, of course, Dracula was a real historical figure. He was nothing like the uh, uh, fictitious sort of vampire figure that many people know about. The real Dracula was a man by the name of Vlad Sepish, who was a Romanian hero who basically fought off the Turks during the, I think it was the 15th and 16th centuries. I might have my dates wrong there. But anyway, so we went and toured. It might have been a little earlier than that, actually. We went and toured um, Dracula's castle. Right? And, uh, of course, again, there's no, no relationship at all to the, you know, so-called Dracula of the movies. Um, but a very interesting thing there. They had a display uh, because, you know, it's kind of creepy. It's a castle, you know. The guy, the, Vlad Sepish was no saint, I'll tell you that. The guy was, he had his own issues. Um, but he wasn't a blood-drinking vampire. Um, 
He just killed people by sticking sticks through them and putting them up in the air. This is a whole other story. Uh, he's called Vlad the Impaler. I mean, the guy was, he was bad news. Uh, but that's why the Turks were so afraid of him. So the Romanians said, man, this guy's a hero. Um, kind of an interesting hero, in my opinion, but that's beside the point. Now, here's the interesting thing. At the, at the castle, they had a um, display of instruments of torture from the medieval period. And you had to pay like an extra two bucks to go see them. And, uh, but here's an interesting thing. You couldn't bring your children in if they were under 16. And there was some nasty stuff in there. Of course, I wanted to go see it because this is something I'm very interested in, not because I'm interested in torture, of course, but because I said to my father-in-law, I said, most of those instruments of torture, listen carefully, were invented by the church. I just let that one settle in. Most of those instruments of torture were invented by the church. And I tell you, there's some just gnarly things, just demonic, satanic things that people would sit around and think creatively, how can we put people in the most possible pain? But here's the interesting thing. They didn't do it just for pain's sake. In the basic theology of the medieval church, they were causing you pain to get you to confess the right thing so that your eternal soul could be saved. So now, man, we're really in a hiccup here with our picture of God because our picture of God not only allows for torture, it, torture becomes a positive thing. Do you see where this, and this is crazy, capital C-R-A-Z-Y, and I wish I could tell you that it was just a very small sector of a very small part in a very you know, limited area of church history, but it's literally the history of century after century after century after century of the Christian church church and it all goes back to what is your picture of God right if you start with an incorrect and perverse picture of God you're going to end up with all kinds of craziness down the line so far so good okay so so Jesus said time is coming when someone will kill you and they're actually thinking that they're doing God a good service right Paul says I know that when I depart from some of you grievous wolves are going to come in not sparing the flock okay John here writes about, about Antichrist, and many scholars believe it was John is actually the one that termed the, that he coined the phrase Antichrist, that that's, that that's his term, that he created it and crafted it. And this is from one of his epistles, 1 John. Uh, he writes, little children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, now remember, that's first century. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know it is the last hour. He goes on to say, Okay. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Now, this is interesting. He says, these antichrists came from the church. That's what he's saying. The spirit, the spirit of antichrist actually started in the church and then left the church. That was Paul's point and Jesus' point and Daniel's point much earlier. By this, we know the, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, here's our point. Which you have heard was coming and now already, is now already where? In the world. So that's back to our airplane analogy. And we don't have time to go into what John means by come in the flesh, etc. But but for, for our purposes here, you know, the airplane takes off, the airplane of the church. And literally, before you even get to the second century... Both John and Paul are saying the spirit that actuates Antichrist, the persecuting, superstitious spirit, he says, is already in the church. I mean, the church has just started. It's a little bit like saying, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. The show is going to be terrible. I mean, it just, it just happens immediately. Constantine, again, only puts the hand in the cement of something that was already going on. So far, so good? And again, I just want to reiterate, a great book on this very thing is The Great Controversy. There are other good books, but that's a a particularly good one. Well, with regards to what happened to the church, what you end up experiencing is sort of a dual phenomenon. And the dual phenomenon is two sides of the same coin. Scholars have identified that, that what really takes place in the third, fourth centuries and beyond, after the conversion of Constantine, is two fancy words. And the first one is the de-Judaization of the faith. And it's just what it sounds like. The un-Jewishing of the faith. And the second one is the Hellenization of the faith, which is basically the Greeking of the faith. Two sides of the same coin. 
Okay, so here's what ends up happening. As the church begins to grow, it grows fastest and most successfully among the Gentile community, the, the, the Greek-speaking, Greek-thinking community. Well, what, what ends up happening effectively is that the church is becoming increasingly distant from its Jewish roots and from its biblical roots too, by the way. Here's a kind of interesting way to think about it. I heard this analogy a while back and I've never forgotten it. The apostolic church, that is to say the writers of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, and others, they thought of the Jewish faith as their faith. They were Jews, and it was their faith. You can think of it this way. They thought of the Jewish faith as their mother, right? They were the mother and, and gave birth to this thing called the church. But after you get into the third and fourth centuries, when the church is largely Gentile now, and the Jewish influence is increasingly and is, is decreasing, or I should say increasingly small, which is just another way of saying the same thing, the church of the third and fourth centuries think of Judaism not as their mother, but as their mother-in-law. <laughs> right? You feel that? Now, some of you are saying that, well, I'm a perfectly good mother-in-law. Okay, good. Well, you're the exception then, maybe. Um, but the point is kind of a well-made one. In other words, your mother is somebody that you have a really strong connection with, and your mother-in-law is somebody that somebody else has a really strong connection with, right? Namely, your spouse in this case. And I hope I didn't offend any mothers-in-law there. And if I did, sorry, still a good analogy. Um, <laughs> So, so, so don't miss the point. Basically, as the early church began to grow and the Gentile percentage and population was increasing, the Jewish population uh, relative was, was decreasing, and this caused basically the de-Judaization of the church. It served to detach the church from its Jewish and biblical roots. A case in point of this is the loss of Sabbath sacredness, right? The Sabbath was a... Was a perceived as a Jewish institution, and as the church became increasingly Gentile, and when this was accelerated again with the conversion of Constantine, the Sabbath just became very insignificant, especially when Constantine is promoting Sunday now. And so that the, the umbilical cord with Judaism is snipped. Well, something is going to take that place, and what ends up taking the place is Hellenization, which is just another way of saying the Greeking. The Hellenization of the church served to bring pagan teachings and ideas into the church, and this was accelerated by the conversion of Constantine. So the church is becoming less and less Jewish, more and more Greek. Less and less what? Jewish and more and more Greek. And this affected, as we've already talked about, the way that God was viewed, and what we're going to see here is the way that the nature of man is viewed. Now, especially with regards to death, the Jews had very specific, or excuse me, the Greeks had very specific ideas about what a man was made up of and, and what made a human being and a woman as well. And we've already mentioned that anthropological dualism. Now, with that sort of in mind, I'm going to give me the next slide here, guys. As Greek thinking comes into the church, what we encounter is anthropological dualism. And I'm just going to give you a definition here. This is Greek thinking, and it's that man is fundamentally two parts matter and spirit, okay? Now, there's almost some truth to that, but here's where the Greeks went awry. Um, they believed that the spirit was the real part of man, the, the real thing, and not just the real thing, but the pure thing and the eternal thing. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. This thing is going to go away, right? But the spirit is the true thing. It's the pure thing. So that when the body eventually goes away and decomposes, and the, and the, the Greeks tended to take a low view of the body, not all of them, but particularly the Stoics and others. They took a low view of the body and of anything material because they viewed this as the lesser of the, of the two worlds. The real world was the immaterial world, the spiritual world. That's where real virtue resided. And so when man died, watch this, he didn't really die. He went on to a higher and better plane of existence. That's the spiritual world. Okay, so the Greeks basically had this idea of the eternal spirit, but the temporal body. The temporal body is passing away, and you can almost kind of understand their logic. I mean, they'd seen people die, and the body decomposed. So they thought, oh, that thing's, what good is a body if it can just rot away and go back to the dirt? But they believed in this eternal spirit, this transcendent spirit. Well, anthropological monism is, is rather than being made of two parts, it's being made of what? One part, and that's what, that's what the Bible teaches. It's that man is fundamentally one in nature, body and spirit combining to make a living soul. 
And this is exactly what we already saw in our presentation on uh, does God have time for me? When God spoke, 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 spoke things into existence, but then he came and he fashioned who? Adam. And then what did he do? He breathed into his nostrils and Adam, watch this, became a living soul. Don't miss that. There are two parts, right? The physical part, the, the clay, the dirt, the, the body part, and the spirit. But these two coalesce. They combine to form one being. In Greek thinking, you're kind of two beings. You're the material being that will eventually decompose and rot away, and you're the spiritual being. Well, you might be thinking, okay, 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 anthropological dualism, monism, you say tomato, I say tomato. You say potato, I say potato. What's the big deal? Hoo-hoo! If only it were that simple. It's a huge deal because it undermines, on many levels, it undermines in this particular area the, the hope that we have in Christ's resurrection. You see, the, the great teaching of the New Testament is that Jesus lived and died, as, as we've already spoken of, that he bore the weight of the sins of the world, that, that he suffered with us and alongside us as both God and man. But the, the good news is not just that he lived and he died, but that he rose again. And when he rose again, he conquered death so that he could give, watch this, he could give eternal life to those who put faith in him. Let me just quote you the best known verse in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So here's the point. What gets the believer or any person eternal life, the believer, those that put their faith in Christ's covenant faithfulness, believes in Christ's covenant faithfulness, is the Messiah's resurrection. Right? But in Greek thinking, you already have eternal life. Well, it gets even worse. It gets even worse because in that medieval period, right, when the church thought, oh, a little torture here and there, you know, it's no problem. In fact, it can actually be a good thing. If you take a human being that has an eternal soul, now that's not a biblical idea. It's a Greek idea. Right? It actually goes back even earlier than the Greeks, but we're tracing it here to the Greeks for our purposes. It goes back to the Egyptians and the Babylonians before that. It goes actually back to the Garden of Eden when Satan said to Eve, you will not surely die. Okay? But if you take somebody with an eternal spirit and you put them in the fires of hell, well, how long are they going to be there? Well, how long could an eternal spirit burn if it was left there to burn? Eternally, forever. So the idea of an eternally burning hell actually grows out of not any biblical text or biblical teaching, but actually grows out of this very idea of anthropological dualism, that man is essentially two beings. He's a material being that will pass away, but he's, he's a material being that will pass away, but he's a spiritual being that's eternal. Right? And so all of a sudden, what seems just like a, you say tomato, I say tomato. You say potato, I say potato. It's just a small thing. All of a sudden, we have a whole different portrait and picture of who God is based on one small teaching. So is information important? Is correct biblical teaching important? Of course it is, but it's not just about that. It's not just about getting people to believe the right thing. I've met people that are like, you need to believe that when you die, you sleep the sleep of death and you await the resurrection who know what's right, but when I've really questioned them about it, like, why, why is it so significant? They couldn't tell you the things I'm telling you now. They just know what's right. As if that's the kind of God we serve, a God who's just out to save the people who were right. Let me tell you something. It's far more important to be righteous than right. Jesus again and again and again affirmed people who were not totally right in their theology right? But they were righteous in their behavior, whether it was the Syrophoenician woman or the woman at the well or the Roman centurion. In fact, on one occasion, Jesus had the audacity to say when a Roman centurion said, no, just speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, oh, I've not seen faith like this in all of Israel. And they were like, not only are you affirming a Roman, not just a Roman, but a Roman centurion, but you're actually elevating a Roman centurion above the very chosen people of God who have all the right answers about everything? You see what Jesus is doing? Jesus was less concerned with right and more concerned with righteous. Yeah? So it's one thing to believe the right thing about what happens when you die. It's quite another to know why it matters and how does it inform your picture of God. So far, so good? Okay. So let's just deal a little bit with this. The greatest question in all philosophy, Job 14.10, but man dies and is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last. And where is he? 
<laughs> That's a good question, right? Job's like, where'd that guy go? He was just here yesterday mowing my lawn. Where is he? Oh, he's dead now. Well, where'd he go? Okay, well, that's a, it's a fair question. The first time that my, my uh, children, my two boys, and I went to a funeral, or I went to a funeral with my two boys for my grandfather, one of the greatest men I ever knew, I mean, they were really confused because they'd seen Grandpa before, and, but Dad, he's right there. I'm like, yeah, but he's dead. What, what do you, he's, but he's there, Dad. He's right there. They could see him in the casket, and he looked very similar to the way that, he, that he'd looked a few weeks before when he'd visited. I mean, it was just, it, I just appreciate the childlike difficulty with understanding, like, well, where is he, Dad? He's, he's there. Why isn't he talking? Well, he's not alive. Expl Death is a foreign idea, right? It doesn't, it's not perfectly logical to a child to explain that the person's there but not there. So far, so good. And so Job says, yeah, you know, the guy passes away. He breathes his last breath. Where did he go? Right? Well, the Greeks would say, and many evangelical Christians and Catholics and Orthodox Christians would say, oh, they go to heaven or to hell, conversely. Right? But what does Scripture say? Right? Scripture doesn't say either of those. Scripture actually says that he goes to sleep. We're going to get to that in just a moment here. Uh, this is Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. I love this. Speaking of Jesus coming to earth, inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood. He himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who the fear of death were all their lives subject to bondage. I like this, because it says that Jesus basically came and he became a man so that he could die. Now appreciate that. God as God can't die. That's not going to happen. He's an eternal being. God is, is incapable of dying. He's incapacitated from dying. By, it's like a square circle, right? If God is the fountain of life, how can the fountain of life die? Which is why the paradox of Jesus' death is so amazing. The only way that Jesus could endure death, according to Hebrews 2, is to become a man, right? But he came, became a man so that he could by death destroy death and him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And then he says, so that you and I don't have to be afraid of death anymore. Right? Look at, the, look at the last part of the verse, he says, who were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And you look at culture after culture, just anthropologically, socially, and you'll see that cultures tend to be extremely superstitious about death, even our own culture. You know, we have cemeteries and we put people in nice beds. I mean, many people are put in beds when they're dead that are much nicer than the beds they were sleeping in when they were alive, right? And then we bury them in cemeteries and we put little stones over there. We write nice things and we bring flowers. And I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with this. I'm saying that every culture has its sort, sort of own little idiosyncratic way, its own little unique cultural way of dealing with death. Y you with me on that? And in no small degree, much of this is to placate our natural fear of death. But what the, what the Bible says is, oh man, you got to be kidding. Jesus came and he whacked the devil. He whacked the devil because he became a man. He died so that he could raise from the dead and destroy any residual fear that we might have of death. And then the Bible goes so far as to call death as innocuously and as harmlessly, and I would even say as positively as you can imagine, it calls it a sleep. I mean, this is just so awesome, completely awesome. You see these young kids today nowadays with the no fear shirts. And, you know, they, 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 these guys are brave, man, doing double backflips on motorcycles and, you know, surfing some waves that I would never surf and jumping out of airplanes and other things. I mean, to me, I think you should be a little afraid. I think it'll serve you well. But, but the real people that have no fear are those that have put their faith in Christ because he's conquered any fear of death. Yeah? Great stuff. We read in Isaiah, or Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, that the Messiah would be cut off, but not for himself. He came on our behalf. He came to, to conquer death for us, and not just for us. Listen carefully to the language. He came to conquer death as us, because he was a real human being. We've mentioned before several times, he was the real Adam, and he was the real Israel. So when we put our faith in the new Adam and the new Israel, we're born again. There is no fear. That's what we started with. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. G.B. Hardy in his great little book titled Countdown says, there are but two essential requirements. Has anyone ever cheated death and proved it? And is it available to me? That's all I want to know, he says. I just want to know, has anyone cheated death? Because I'm not looking forward to it. Have they proved it? And can I get access to it? 
And then he goes through the record. Here is the complete historical record. Confucius' tomb, occupied. Buddhist tomb, occupied. Muhammad's tomb, occupied. Jesus' tomb, empty. What he goes on to say, and he's not doing a sort of nanny nanny boo boo thing, like na 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 na, my religion's better than your religion. What he's saying is, you know, okay for Muhammad and his sayings, okay for Confucius and his sayings, okay for Buddha and his sayings, but, but they all died. And I really don't want to die. I kind of want to keep living. And so is there anybody who has conquered death and lived? And then the answer is, well, Jesus has. And he says, okay, I need to, I need to talk to him and learn about this guy. Because in a sense, the others are losers. Now, don't hear me wrong on that. They're not losers in the pejorative sense, like you're a loser. No, 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 no. They're, they lost the battle that all human beings lose. That's the battle of death, right? But Jesus is a winner, he won that battle, and what Hardy wants to know is the same thing that I want to know, and that is, is that available to me? And the answer is, it is. And I'm just going to go through a couple quotations here that basically talk about the resurrection of Jesus and the historical reliability. Well, you can sort of think of this anthropological monism, this idea that, that, that the two parts, the body and the breath, make one thing as a light bulb. And here what you have is two things that make one thing. You have the chassis of the light bulb, which is the physical housing, and then you have the electricity, which is like whew, the equivalent of the breath, but it makes one thing, and the thing it makes is a light. Okay? Now, if you disconnect the, the, the plug from the wall, if you lose the electricity, then what ends up happening is that the light doesn't go to light heaven or light hell. The, the, the light goes away. It ceases to be. And so what you end up with is the light goes out, right? And so by, by way of analogy here, what we have is God formed Adam, like the light bulb, the housing, the chassis, right? But then he breathed that electricity, the breath of God into him, and then he became something that he wasn't formally. Now, this is a bit of a, it's a really cool philosophical point. You have an emergent property, and the emergent property is a living being. You take two things, you put them together, and now you have, in the same way, if you have a line and then you have another line and you connect them, you have an emergent property in math. It's called an angle, right? But if you divorce the two, you no longer have an angle. You just have two lines, right? So it's not as though the angle went anywhere. The emergent property ceased to exist when the, when the necessary and sufficient conditions to create it came together. Right? You can think of a box made of nails and wood. If you make a box out of nails and wood and you build it right here, you can say, oh, there's the box. But if you then pull the nails out and put the nails in a pile here and the wood in a pile here, where did the box go? The box didn't go anywhere. That emergent property of boxness or lightness or, or life, whatever you want to call it, or angleness is gone now because the two things that came together to make it are now separate. Make sense? So, so this is why we say at a funeral, or what was historically said, traditionally said, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Because when somebody breathes their last breath, they die. And their body goes back to the dust, and the Bible calls this a sleep. Now, I want to show you a really cool verse of Scripture in John chapter 11. Jesus gets word that his friend Lazarus is sick. And rather than racing to Lazarus rescue and assistance, the Bible says that he waits. He waits a few days. And uh, so we'll pick it up here in verse uh, 3. Therefore the sister sent to Jesus and said, John chapter 11, verse 3, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was, then he said, hey, let's go to Judea again. Now, an interesting thing happens here, a sort of interesting con conversation between he and his disciples, because Jesus eventually says after a couple days, hey, let's go to my friend Lazarus because he's sleeping and I want to wake him up. Well, the last that the disciples would heard was that he was not feeling well, and so the disciples give him a little piece of health advice, and they say, oh, Jesus, here's a piece of advice. If somebody's not feeling well and they're sick and they're getting a good rest, let them sleep. Right? And then Jesus says to them, this is in verse 14, then Jesus said to the disciples plainly three words, Lazarus is dead. But it's an interesting thing that Jesus did. He didn't first call it death. He didn't say our friend Lazarus is dead. What he, says is, what he said is our friend Lazarus is sleeping, but I'm going to go wake him up. 
Now, it's interesting, when he arrives at the tomb and Mary and Martha come out to greet him and, and end up talking to him, um, Jesus says something to Martha that's very interesting. He says, your brother will rise again. And she says, oh, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She didn't say, well, I know he's already in heaven with God. No, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And that's where Jesus made his famous statement. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he will live again. Right? It's just absolutely awesome, this idea here. And uh, we have text after text after text that sort of buttress this basic idea. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, Paul writing about God says, Who alone, God, has immortality? That means he's not subject to death. God alone is not subject to death. That's the point we just made a moment ago. That's why Jesus had to become a man so that he could die, something that he could not do as God. Dwelling in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. The Greeks didn't believe that. The Greeks believed that you naturally possessed immortality by virtue of your eternal spirit. The biblical picture is that God gives you eternal life as a gift. Do you hear the difference? Totally a different, uh, an entirely different picture. Psalm 115 verse 17 says, The dead don't praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. Well, why? Because they're sleeping the sleep of death and awaiting the resurrection. Job 14 verse 12. This was the same Job that just asked the question a moment ago. The man breathes his last breath and he departs. Where did he go? So a man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused out of their sleep. Psalm 13, verse 3, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, and lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. James chapter 2, verse 26, For as the body without the, the spirit or breath is dead, so faith without works is also dead. This is why we have the phrase, He breathed his last. Or in the old Elizabethan English, he gave up the ghost. That's just another way of saying that the breath goes forward and the body dies. But the point that many of our Christian friends and, and the Greeks make is they think that that spirit, that, that final breath, that that somehow possesses identity and personhood and, and, and consciousness. No, it just goes back to God. And the person is in the grave. Over and over again, the teaching of the New Testament is that that person is in the grave and they will be raised when Jesus returns and resurrects them. Let me just read that in John chapter 5. Jesus is speaking here in John chapter 5 and listen to what he says. 38 and 39, John chapter 5. Uh, excuse me, 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this. Don't be surprised at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. He's basically saying, don't be surprised by this. When, when I return, I will speak. And as I speak, I will call people from the graves. And in, universally in the Old and the New Testaments, you find this again and again. In Daniel chapter 12, it says, many of those that sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Let me show you another favorite. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I love this one. Verse 51. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When? At the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This is exactly what Martha believed. Oh, I know that Lazarus will be okay in the resurrection at the last day. Paul says here, not everyone's going to go to sleep because some people will be alive when Jesus returns. Some people will live right through that experience. And so the, the, the bottom line here is just absolutely amazing, is that God gives us eternal life as a gift. Job 14 says, the heavens, till the heavens are no more, I will wait till my change. You will call and I will answer you. Call where? Call from the heavens. Now, here's an interesting thing, not well known. What I'm telling you right here is actually what many of the early reformers actually believed. William Tyndale, the translator of the English Bible, look at what Tyndale wrote. This would have been 600 years ago. Look at what he said. I confess openly that I am not persuaded that they, the deceased, be already in the full glory that Christ is in or the elect angels of God are in. 
Neither is it any article of my faith. For if it were so, I see, but, I see not, but that the preaching of the resurrection of the flesh were a thing in vain. You see what he's saying? He's saying it's not any part of my faith that the deceased are already in heaven because really what would be the point of the deceased, what would be the point of the resurrection if the deceased were already in heaven? Making sense? And even Martin Luther, going back to Martin Luther, the reformer, translator of the German Bible. Look at what he says here. Another place he's commenting on, I think, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Another place proving that the dead have no feeling. There are, saith he, no duty, no science, no knowledge, no wisdom there. Solomon judges that the dead are, what is that word? Asleep and feel nothing at all. For the dead lie there, accounting neither days nor years. But when they are awakened, they will seem to have slept scarce one minute. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but that's how I sleep, man. I'm not one of these guys that's getting up in the middle of the night and tossing and turning and going to the bathroom and all that. Maybe that'll happen as I get older, I'm told. Um, <laughs> But at this point in my life, man, I literally, I go to sleep mid-sentence. My wife's like talking to me and I'm gone. I just, my friends used to joke that I had a button under my arm. I just like push the button and just like go to sleep and then ding, wake up, you know, six, seven, eight, uh, preferably eight hours later. And when I wake up, it was just like it was a moment, except that I got to watch the cinema, the dream all night long, right? I got to see it. And, and so too with us, so too with us in the resurrection, when someone dies, they sleep the sleep of death. They have no consciousness, no awareness, no cognition until the resurrection. And at the resurrection, Jesus comes back because he tasted death for every man. He has a right to resurrect those who have put faith in him. Yeah, that's good news. And so no one is left in the grave. He calls them forth. They immediately are raised to newness of life. And it seems but a moment. Whether they've been in the grave for five years or 500 years, it seems like just a moment. Now, we're not saying that they're literally sleeping. And the Bible's not saying that they're literally sleeping. It's not as though you could go, you know, <laughs> of course, nobody's saying that. But it, it's like a sleep, right? And we are, our identity, our personhood, our character is safely in the mind and in the heart of God. And when God returns, he will call, just as Jesus did at Lazarus' tomb. Lazarus, come forth. And shoo, Lazarus comes out of the tomb. The great good news about this, the overall thing that I want you to take away is number one, that death is not something that the believer has to be afraid of because Jesus has been there, done that, right? As they say, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, right? Jesus has been there, he's done that. He's experienced death, we have nothing to fear. And the second takeaway here is, this gives us such a beautiful picture of God because here we have a God, and this will become very clear in our next presentation on hell, here we have a God who, as a God of love, as a God of goodness, as a God of grace, gives eternal life as a gift. It's not something that I inherently possess because I am so whatever, eternal, amazing, awesome in myself. No, God gives me eternal life as a gift. That's what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, puts faith in him, would not perish but have everlasting life.